We turn to Resolution 16 on Immigration Rules, to be moved by Anne McLaughlin and seconded by David MacDonald. Anne, of course, is our candidate in Glasgow North East. <laughs> Conference, I will in a moment come on to explain the specifics of the resolution, but first let me state loudly and clearly from this SNP conference, if you have chosen to make Scotland your home, or if you've found yourself here because you've been forced to flee your home, or if you've decided you want to contribute your skills to building Scotland's economy and society, thank you. You are welcome here. Why are you welcome? Let me give you three reasons. One, because we need you. Unless people already here are going to start breeding at a faster rate than they have been, we need you to build our economy, pay the taxes, buy the goods and pay our pensions. Two, because some of you need us. We did not get the reputation we've got for being the friendliest part of the United Kingdom by turning our backs on people when they need us. And three, because in fact, those of you who bring different cultural practices, different ways of looking at the world, different music, accents, languages, clothing, you stop us getting stuck in our ways. You liven us up. You teach us about other parts of the world. You give us new perspectives. And above all else, our interactions with you show us that no matter how different our pasts may have been, no matter how different our perspectives may still be, we can still relate to one another because we are all human beings, all citizens of the world, and I, for one, love having that knowledge. So let me turn to the specifics of the resolution. If you fall in love with and marry someone from overseas, it will be better for you if you make it someone from the European Economic Area. Because if you fall in love with and marry someone from out with Europe, you will have to jump through hoops to bring your wife or husband to this country. And some of you will not be able to jump high enough, no matter how hard you try. The rules are that you must be earning a salary of at least £18,600 per annum. For many, and particularly for many women, that is simply out of reach. The Office for National Statistics published figures last year that showed that four out of five new jobs pay £2,000 a year below that threshold. Let me tell you about a friend of mine who went on holiday to Egypt. She met and eventually married her husband, her soon-to-be ex-husband. Not because she stopped loving him, not because he stopped loving her, but because she spent years trying to get him into Scotland to no avail. When they applied for a visitor visa, he was unemployed, and so the UKBA turned him down on the grounds that no one, he would be likely to abscond the minute he set foot on UK soil because, and I quote, he had nothing to return home to. Conference, that just shows you what a warped view of people some people have. He had a mother, a father, a brother, a sister, nieces and nephews. He had a family that he loved and who loved him back. That is not nothing. I see a light coming on, so I'm going to move on. Conference, I'm standing in Glasgow North East. They say it's Labour's safest seat. I hope we're not on TV just now because I kind of like them to keep thinking that. Yeah. <laughs> Let me tell you a secret, and this is just between us, okay? If this is Labour's safest seat, then there truly are no safe seats left for them. Conference, there are many reasons why I want to be the MP for Glasgow North East. One of those is so that I can reacquaint myself with the UK Border Agency. I want to go back to them and when they say to me, refer to MPs, I'll say to them, you're looking at the new MP for nice Glasgow time. North East. 
support the resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. We're broadcasting live, incidentally. <laughs> and David MacDonald will second to be followed by Stephanie Baker. Good morning, uh, conference. Can I start as the grandson of an immigrant by doing what Anne done? Because we don't do it enough, and that is to thank our migrant community, a community a community who hold our society together from migrant teachers, bus drivers, builders, doctors, shop workers, nurses, and so many more. A community who this party will stand with, who we will never allow to be scapegoated, blamed, or ridiculed by right-wing reactionary racists or as I like to call them, UKIP. <laughs> Conference, this motion is a good example of where SNP MPs at Westminster can make positive changes, not just for families in Scotland, but across these aisles. A few months ago, I had a constituent who came to me in tears, fraught with worry over an immigration case involving their families in a very similar set of circumstances that Anne explained. In desperation to keep their family together, they had gone to their MP for help and they had been ignored. Their MP is Ian Davidson. He's worse than that, he's worse than that. He had failed to respond to them. He had failed to answer their calls or their emails. He failed in his most basic duty as an elected representative. And with all his usual grace, he then told them that he wouldn't be able to offer them any assistance because the family member concerned who lived abroad was not one of his constituents. When I tried to intervene, I received a dismissive reply from the Home Office because they wouldn't respond to me as a lowly councillor. Colleagues, with that kind of indifferent attitude at the Home Office and a Parliament full of uninterested MPs, it's easy to understand why our immigration system is in such a mess. So it's not just the immigration system that needs to be replaced, but it's also the politicians who have created this dysfunctional system that need to be replaced. They need to be replaced with people like Anne McLaughlin, who spoke so passionately and who will make a difference to the lives of migrants, asylum seekers and others in this city. We need to replace those uncaring Westminster MPs with a block of SNP MPs who can start to improve our immigration system, who can model it to meet Scotland's needs, a system that is free from the moral stains of dawn raids, of detention and of forced destitution. A system that extends access to overseas students, an effective immigration system that allows us to build Thank our David. economy and our population. A welcoming system that adds a new strand to our national tartan. Please support the motion. Thank you. And I call Stephanie Baker to be followed by Sandra White, MSP. And Stephanie is a first-time speaker at conference. Do you have to excuse me? I'm a bit of a nervous speaker. Um, Immigration rules aren't something that most people focus on. I don't blame them because the rules are constantly changing and becoming ever more so complicated. I'm forced a bit to be a little bit savvy about the rules because as you, I clearly am an immigrant. My story is not the only one, but I'm hoping to put a bit of a face on this issue. I moved to Scotland in 2010, and by the time I'm finished with my PhD, I'll have lived here for over five years. I see Scotland as my home. And unlike, under most visa types, after five years of residency, I would be allowed to apply for more permanent residency. Uh, student visas are kind of an exception for this. Instead, I have several visa alternative, expensive alternatives. I have the doctoral extension visa, which would then allow me to get a type two visa. Effectively, 
any sort of long-term residency would only start five years from then. And even with that, I would be required to apply for jobs that would be looked at for EU and UK applicants for several months before I'd be allowed to be considered, despite having been here for a few years. That doesn't even get into the actual details, the expensiveness of these visas. Without these other types of visas, I'm given four months to pack up my life because after that point, they can't, you know, they don't care where I go, but as long as I can't stay here. Only the most callous want to separate families, but very little effort is spent on those who think they're, you know, see their, their life is here, but without actually having a partner. I have people I care about with whom my life would not be complete. But without actually having a spouse, it's not really a, a person to sponsor me. My story is only one, but I'm certainly not the only one. We immigrants want to be productive and make more and be part of the society, but we just need a little bit of help in order to get to stay. Thank you. Thank you. I call Sandra White, MSP. Is smaller, the toll bit was smaller, so perhaps that'll be better. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Chair. It's fellow delegates, I don't know if you've seen the latest Labour Party merchandise. Uh, you may have seen it on Facebook, you may have seen it on Twitter. I kid you not, their new campaign merchandise is a mug, a red mug, which says controls on immigration. What have the Labour Party become when they're selling merchandise that says controls on immigration? I actually, I would call on the Scottish Labour Party here today to absolutely apologise for the appalling racist stuff that they're putting forward on their merchandise. A Labour Party is supposed to welcome people and they're actually selling this. You can buy it online for $4.99. Labour control immigration. I'm absolutely astounded by that. That's why I'm so proud to be a member of the SNP, which does welcome people into this country. And I thank Anne and Proven constituency branch for bringing this motion here today. I want to give you some examples of some of the constituency work that I'm involved in, as are others. I told you last year about the pensioner couple who are still awaiting if they can actually stay, the wife can actually stay here. People of 64 and 67 years of age still waiting for that. I have a couple who actually is a very sad ending, a young couple with a baby. The wife is from America, similar to some others that were here today. Now that marriage is all but broken. The wife and the young baby have had to go back to America and the husband has had to stay here and he is bereft. And that is immigration controls from Westminster. We don't want any truck with that. We want justice for the people that come to this country. I want to give you another example. I won't name the person. Many people here may know this person who's actually here today. A very high profile case. A very famous musician who lives in the Kelvin constituency, which I represent. He was told to go back to America. This man is a famous musician. He works in the conservatoire. He teaches. He earns a living. He has never taken a penny from the state. And yet they told him, you need to go back to America. You no longer wanted or belong here. We fought that extradition. We took it to court and we won that appeal. We won it. We won it. I see the lights flashing, so I just want to say at this moment in time, we won that. But guess what? The Home Office are appealing that decision. What has this man or anyone else ever done except bring joy and bring to the country? Please support this resolution Thanks, and make sure the word goes out that this is a fair and just society. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. There are no cards in against. The conference can ask, does the resolution pass by acclaim? It is. Thank you. And now, resolution 17 on general election 2015, Stronger for Scotland, I call Angus Robertson, MP, to move to be seconded by Tommy Shepherd, the candidate for Murray. Angus Robertson. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Derek, 
Um, can I take the opportunity to urge all of you to actually have a look at the wording of the motion that we are considering? It's not a long motion, but I think the words are, are very, very important in these historic times for the SNP and these historic times uh, for Scotland. We welcome the talented and diverse group of candidates selected to stand for the Scottish National Party at the 2015 general election. We have tremendous candidates, don't we, conference? We have people who joined politics during the referendum, active in the business community, in the trades unions, in the Scots Asian community, in the gay, lesbian, bisexual community. I could go on and on and on and on. Our candidates reflect Scotland. We want to have them elected. We want Scotland's voice to be heard. The resolution goes on that we believe that only the election of SNP MPs in May will ensure that the Westminster parties deliver their promise of a powerhouse parliament that can create more jobs and protect our public services. Do we think for one minute that the Labour Party, the Tories and the Lib Dems are going to deliver Devo Max, Home Rule or as close to federalism as you can possibly imagine? Do we really think that they are going to deliver that? I think not. I think not. We need as many SNP MPs as possible to do just that. Conference further believes that a strong group of SNP MPs holding the balance of power at Westminster will force Labour to think again on austerity and the renewal of tried nuclear weapons. Conference, I and my SNP colleagues at Westminster sat and watched Labour MPs, Labour MPs w vote in the same lobbies as the Tories on the austerity budget for the forthcoming years. Shame on you, Labour. Shame on you. The SNP didn't. We voted against. We need more MPs at Westminster to ensure that we don't have the consensus of Labour and Tory austerity cuts foisted on the weakest in our society. Conference resolves that the Scottish National Party MPs elected in May will never put the Tories into government and will always fight Scotland's corner. Never forget that in this Parliament that is just coming to an end, there is a non-Tory majority in that Parliament. Do you know why there is a Tory government at Westminster? Because the Labour Party let them. Shame on you, Labour. Shame on you, Labour. Everything that has happened in the recent years is because Douglas Alexander and his Scottish Labour Party colleagues were not prepared to vote and work with the SNP. That must change. That will change. I'm tremendously proud of my colleagues at Westminster in the SNP group. We are but six. And I would like you to show your appreciation, please, to Stuart Hosey, to Mike Weir, to Pete Wishart, to Ailey Whiteford, to Angus McNeil. They are stars. But we need more. We need many more. Because we can change Scotland forever. Let's end the dinosaurs. Let's end the branch office mentality. Let's put Scotland first. Let's elect the largest contingent of SNP MPs ever. And let's move Scotland forward to independence. Thank you very much. Thank you, Angus. I now call Tommy Shepherd uh, to second to be followed by Margaret Ferrier. Of course, Tommy is not just a first-time speaker, but our candidate in Edinburgh East. Thank you, Conference. Like many people in this country, I used to be a member of the Labour Party. In my case, for over 20 years, rising to the dizzy heights of being Assistant Secretary of the Labour Party in Scotland. And like many people in this country, I am no longer a member of the Labour Party and I am proud to be a member of the SNP. I joined, I joined the Labour Party as a young man because I believed 
in equality and social justice. I believed in fairness at home, and I believed in peace and disarmament abroad. And it is because I believe now in the things that I believed then that I am a member of the SNP. Because the Labour Party, the Labour Party has given up on that ambition. It has betrayed the aspirations of the communities of Scotland, and it is no longer fit to represent them. That's why, when it comes to the 7th of May, we shall get rid of the Labour Party in Scotland, and we shall put backbone into the Labour Party in England. <laughs> Conference, what has, happened, what has happened in the last six months with this party is not just the growth of an existing political party, it is a political realignment in our country. And it is happening the length and breadth of the country, but it is happening most in the working class communities in our inner city areas, where people are now turning to this party to be the champions of change, to be the agents of progress. And that is what we intend to be. And it's interesting to see the reaction of some of the more excitable sections of the London media to this prospect. The Daily Mail, for example, seems in a state of apoplexy about what will happen. And it says it's a democratic outrage that we should seek to influence the government of the United Kingdom. I would remind the Daily Mail that it wasn't us who wanted to be in the United Kingdom. That was their idea. That was their idea. And they have a cheek to suggest to people in Scotland that there is something illegitimate, something to be questioned about the democratic choices they make in free and fair elections to the United Kingdom Parliament. If there's anything sinister going on in this election, it is elements of the right-wing press who are trying to undermine our democracy and undermine the choices which the people of Scotland will make. And I say something else to the Daily Mail and some of its acolytes, because we've seen this as well. They've said that what we're trying to do is to achieve independence through the back door. Let me tell the Daily Mail and its readers, the next time we consult the Scottish people and the government of their own country, as we will, we're coming up the front path. You won't see us scuttling round the back. Conference, what this is really about, what this is really about is a degree of paranoia. On the 18th of September, we sent the British establishment a message and we gave them a shock. On the 7th of May, we can visit upon them their worst nightmare. We can send from this country a majority of people to the Palace of Westminster who will not dance to the tune of the British establishment, but who instead march to the rhythm of the people of Scotland. That will be... That will be refreshing. That will be an amazing improvement to our democracy, not just in this country, but it will be good for the people of the rest of these islands as well. Support the motion. Tommy, as we say in the west of Scotland, that was no bad. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I now call Margaret Ferrier, who is our candidate in Rutherglen, to be followed by Hannah Bardell. Morning conference. After the 7th of May, with a strong team of SNP MPs at Westminster, we can keep hope on the agenda in the House of Commons. We can keep Scotland on the agenda. We will not put profit before people, advantaged before disadvantaged. The Tories want you to vote them back in to inflict another five years of cruel austerity cuts on the nation. Cuts that will be more severe than those that have gone before. They wish to squander £100 billion on a new generation of nuclear weapons instead of investing in a new generation of children. And let us take a look at Labour. A once proud Socialist Party, Keir Hardy, founder member, advocated Home Rule and a democratic government to name but two, the Social Democratic Party. On Wikipedia, it openly calls the new leadership of the party under Miliband, Blue Labour. 
Well, they do appear to have been happy to endorse the next round of 30 billion cuts of, of Tory austerity cuts that will be more severe than those that have gone before. But, in their words, we voted to balance the books. Whose books would that be? The more people that I talk to on the doorstep during this general election, the more I hear the expression, I am robbing Peter to pay Paul. Now, I know that everyone's familiar with the tale of A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. It tells us about Ebenezer Scrooge, who came to his senses after visitation with the three ghosts of Christmas past, present and future. Well, I think that a ghost will be visiting Labour on the 7th of May after being such comfortable bed partners with the Tories. <clears throat> the referendum ghost will haunt them forever. The Scottish electorate do not forget these things easily. We can see that with the recent polls. It's time to leave the politics of the past behind. In fact, I'll let you into a secret. Scaring the electorate no longer works. What does work is listening to them, taking on board their concerns and acting on them to push through legislation that will enhance and improve lives for the many, not the few. On the, <laughs> on the other hand, our party, we have reached a, an initial target of 100,000 new members. And we've been hearing that there are people throughout the UK who would love to have the opportunity to vote SNP. What does that say about our party? It tells me that it has the trust of the people. The party is in tune with the mood of the nation with regards to policy making, which are proving popular. The people of Scotland are relying on us to represent their interests, be their voice, and we cannot and should not let them down. We need to have strong voices down at Westminster to say, enough is enough. We reject austerity. Every single person matters. Common decency should prevail. My message today is let us all work hard and do absolutely everything in our power to send as many SNP MPs down to Westminster as possible. There's no room for complacency. We never take one single vote for granted. The party of Scotland can change this nation for the better, but Britain will also change under our positive influence in the House of Commons. And when we look back at the period in the history of our party, we will be rightly proud of all our achievements. We have 39 days to go. Let's all get to work. Thank you. <clears throat> now call Hannah Bardell, who is our candidate in the Livingston constituency. Welcome, Hannah. Conference, it is an honour and a privilege to stand before you as the SNP's Westminster candidate for the Livingston constituency. I can it's my hometown and my home area, and it's, it's an area where we have a track record of incredible people in politics, not least our two MSPs, Angela Constance and Fiona Hislop, who sit in our gender balanced cabinet. I will be the sixth female parliamentary candidate, and it will be the ninth time that the sixth female parliamentary candidate in a row and it will be the ninth time that we have fielded a female candidate in West Lothian. So I feel the weight of expectation and hope on my shoulders for that reason among many others. For all of us here the referendum changed politics in Scotland and that Nelson Mandela once said it always seems impossible until it is done. We may not have done it in the referendum, but we moved Scotland forward in a way that no vote or political movement has ever done before. And, and we take that hope, expectation and experience with us on this journey as we move towards Westminster. We want more inclusion, more accountability, more excitement and more trust in our politicians and the incredible talent and range of experience that we have in our candidates for Westminster shows that we can take a group down there and really shake things up at Westminster.
We are willing to challenge the tired economic orthodoxy where the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. That is not good enough in Scotland. It is not good enough across the rest of the UK. We stand for Scotland, we will put Scotland first, but we look across all of the islands and we want to do better for everyone. Yeah. I have a, a fond memory of my grandmother who left school when she was 14 to work and pre prepare uh, for work to serve the rest of the family. Um, she was a very proper lady. She never spoke out. She wasn't outspoken really in any way until Margaret Thatcher described the miners as the enemy within. My family are from a mining community. Livingston has within it many mining communities and people who saw the decimation of their industries disappear under the Thatcher government. That, amongst many other reasons, is why we will never put the Tories back in government. So, conference, I give you my promise that if I'm elected along with my other colleagues to go to Westminster, we will stand up for Scotland, we will fight against austerity, we will fight against Trident, and we will give people something to hope for again in Scotland. Thank you, Thank you Hannah. And our final speaker will be Councillor Drew Henry, who, of course, is the candidate for Inverness, Nairn, Bednach, and Stras Bay. I'm the candidate for Inverness, Nairn, Badenoch and Stras Bay. I'm standing against the sitting MP, Danny Alexander. And you know, there can be no greater example of the difference between the other parties and us. In coalition, he's failed on tuition fees. In coalition, he failed at his promise to tackle Highland's crippling housing debt. I had to go to Westminster to argue with our local MP to protect our European funding when they were looking to cut their spending. He's been He's been doing all these things, breaking all of these promises, when he should have been fighting the Tories, he's been supporting them, when he should have been defending the vulnerable and the poor, he's been attacking them. Perhaps he sees the bedroom tax as one of his great successes. Well, if he does, then help mend him. The SNP have been in coalition in the Highlands and we know how to do it. We've delivered there. You know what we've done nationally. We said when we formed a coalition, we'd deliver 600 council houses. We've already delivered 600 council houses and we're going for a thousand. One of our promises was to introduce the living wage across the whole of the Highland Council, and we delivered that, including for our apprentices. apprentices. Everyone gets a living wage now. And we've developed a long-term view for tackling the problems of gender imbalance in our education system to make sure that we are taking uh, advantage of the opportunities for people when they leave school to go into work, to give young girls and women, as well as our, our own kid, kids, the opportunity to take advantage of the jobs that are not just coming in a few years' time, but the jobs in 20 years' time, by setting up a science skills academy to make sure that everybody, all points of their education, get the ability to take part and be the best that they can be. Like the SNP, like the SNP Scottish Government, We've delivered this in spite of the austerity cuts. We've delivered a progressive agenda. We will go to Westminster and we will do the same there. Before, now and for all time to come for Scotland and her peoples. Thank you.
Thank you, Drew. I'm sorry I can't call any further speakers. There are no cards in against. Conference is a resolution passed by acclaim. Thank you, Conference. We now turn to Resolution 18 on carers to be moved by Kirsten Oswald and seconded by Gavin Newlands. And give Kirsten a warm welcome because she's our candidate in East Renfrewshire. Good morning, Conference. Carers make an enormous contribution to our society. They need and they deserve our support. Caring responsibilities for a loved one, after all, can arise at any time. Disability, illness and injury can affect any one of us. And this has an immense and sometimes devastating impact on all those involved. And as well as the obvious emotional and support needs that a caring situation requires of everyone, there are many practical issues which need to be considered too. Support from local authorities and other agencies can sometimes be patchy. Of course, there's scope for councils to assist with aids and adaptions, and this is welcome. But the extent of this may not always be what's required. Many families are in real need of housing adaptions to allow them to live, as the rest of us can, in appropriate and accessible homes. Families with disabled children can be particularly affected as children grow and needs become more acute in relation to housing. I know of parents caring for disabled children who are not able to live on a ground floor and they have difficulty leaving the house. And parents are terribly anxious about how to lift or bathe their disabled children because they're not in a position to adapt their homes. All families have their own individual struggles, but access to appropriate housing and the ability to modify housing is a huge and very real concern. In any caring situation, this can mean the difference between coping and not coping. But for many, funding the necessary changes to their homes is far from their reach. So conference, we ask you to consider the establishment of funding streams to support these housing needs and to relieve the impossible pressure on council and household budgets. Most homes, particularly new build homes, don't have the space for anything other than minimum requirements. There's simply no room to move around or to store the necessary equipment. This is hugely difficult for those concerned and for those caring for them. The mental health implications for people are very real. The physical characteristics of their home can be the difference between them feeling included or excluded in society. It can make the difference between their home feeling like a refuge or a prison. So we need to consider how we can provide different, more flexible support. We need to consider how we might make it possible for property to be adapted or built to allow families to live in accessible and fit for purpose homes. Local authority and third party grants and loans are often insufficient to meet the specialist needs of families. Banks are also less than keen to offer loans and mortgages to allow property to be adapted because they see no financial increase in the value of the property from doing this. And of course, that is the point. These homes need adapted not to make them more financially viable, but to make them more valuable to the families who live there. Conference. Conference, we propose a scheme whereby the Scottish Government guarantees works of this nature, recouping the funds via long-term loan arrangements or via the sale of the current family home if the loan is required to, bat to build a suitable accessible property. And for those families living in local authority or social housing, there can be a system to support the construction or renovation of properties. This would be useful in terms of financial partnership and efficiency, um, and also help to reduce the backlog of tenants awaiting housing because the properties do not currently suit their needs. And of course, in either case, there are funding streams that could work in tandem with this proposed approach. Um, whatever type of housing, including homeowners, it's indisputable that the lives of families across Scotland could be absolutely transformed. There are huge benefits to the physical and emotional well-being of these concerned if we can make this happen. And it's the right thing to do. Housing is a fundamental in anyone's life. The Carers Bill clearly shows that the needs of those living with disabilities and those with caring responsibilities are well understood and supported by our SNP government. Let's help those in this situation to move forward towards housing that's fit for purpose for their families. Conference, please support the resolution. Thank you.
Thank you, Kirsten. And Gavin Newlands will second to be followed by Councillor Gail Ross. And Gavin's the candidate in Paisley in North Renfrewshire. Thank you, Derek. Conference, I'm delighted to have been asked to second this motion on carers today. However, before I get to the specifics of the motion itself, I'd like to make a wider point about the fantastic work that carers do. In my opinion, we as a society take carers and the work that they do for granted. There is no other explanation as to why we would find it acceptable for carers that are eligible for carers allowance to be paid the pittance that they currently receive. And if the press reports are correct, this very eligibility itself is under threat. Not happy with leaving some carers in penury, the Tories now seem to think too many qualify to receive this vital support. So much for Dave's big society. It is right that we, as we always have, try to look after our rain as much as possible. This support must be fully backed up by government. The simple fact is that there are over three quarters of a million people in Scotland who care for somebody in one capacity or another. Nearly a quarter of them are deemed to be caring for someone on a full-time basis. But truth be told, most of these carers will be working more than 35 hours a week. However, this allowance pays only £61 per week, £11 less than job seekers' allowance, despite being deemed to have been working for a minimum of 35 hours at £1.75 per hour. It gets worse. If you dare to supplement this income with a part-time job, you can only earn up to £102 before you are disqualified from receiving the allowance. That means that a 17-year-old carer in a minimum wage job potentially works and cares for nearly 62 hours a week for £163. That works out at £2.62 per hour. If they earned one penny more, they would lose their allowance. Hardly a king's ransom and certainly not the reward or gratitude that society should bestow upon this young carer. The allowance is soon to be devolved to Holyrood, but the fund sent back from London to administer the allowance is due to be cut yet again. Yet another reason why Westminster can't be trusted to administer our welfare services it's hard to make a difference on pocket money. This motion specifically calls for a fund to help adapt houses to support those with disabilities and their carers. This is a very welcome proposal, and if funded properly, can go a long way to making the lives of those involved a great deal easier and more fulfilling. It can become stressful and disheartening to care for an able-bodied family member or friend, let alone one with a severe disability. We must find a way to make it easier to provide the quality care for both the recipient and the caregiver. No one wants to see their friends or family struggle to care for them. Difficult physical care can have a lasting psychological effect on both parties, and the least the state can do is to help make that care easier. In conclusion, we must see a dramatic change in our approach to carers and start to positively recognise the service they provide for us all. A recent report commissioned by the Scottish Government demonstrates the enormous contribution that carers make to their families, communities and to the wider economy. I'll leave you with this thought. We would all do well to remember that three in five of us here today will be a carer in some capacity throughout our lives. This is one area we really are all in it together. Please support the motion. And our final speaker will be Councillor Gail Ross. Conference, can I begin by saying thank you to each and every carer in our society. You are amazing. <laughs> Conference, in 2010, the Scottish Government published the Carer Strategy for Scotland 2010 to 2015, an excellent document. But today I want to concentrate on the Getting It Right for Young Carer Strategy contained within it. One of the main messages in this document is the identification of young carers by teachers, health professionals and others, including people who work in after-school clubs, churches and the emergency services. At the last National Young Carers Conference, one message came across loud and clear. Young carers need a form of identif identification to make their roles in society easier. And the creation of a young carer's identification card is widely accepted to be one way of doing this. A young carer's ID card would go a long way to reducing stigmatisation for young people, 
It could be a credit card size with photograph of the young person and signed by both the young carer and the cared for person. It would mean that instead of the young person having to explain their situation in front of people, which can sometimes be difficult, especially in a crowd of their peers, they could just show their card and the role would be instantly understood. Being able to identify the young person as a carer would bring many benefits. It would identify them in school and allow teachers to support them appropriately. Because being a young carer can often affect the young person's schoolwork. They may often spend time doing tasks at home and they can often be tired and unable to concentrate on their schoolwork. The card would help the young carers who find it difficult to stay after school without prior warning, arrive at school on time, finish homework on time, or if they need to leave early, carry a mobile phone on silent to keep in touch with a cared for person, or sometimes even just if they need someone to talk to. It would enable them to pick up medicines on behalf of the cared for person. A national card would be accepted at pharmacies all across Scotland and would allow for consistency across NHS boards and local authorities. It would make the young person active partners in the care of their loved one. Young carers often have vital information about the person they care for, and they often need to know more about the health condition of their loved one. This ID card will enable the cared for person to give informed consent to healthcare practitioners to discuss the information about their health and care with the young carer. They need to be treated as a partner in care and not dismissed. It would validate and recognise their role. Being a young carer means that a lot of the freedoms that most of our young people enjoy and take for granted are reduced. So in summary, a national young carers card would enhance the status of young carers, validate their role, reduce their stigma in school and wider society and help make their lives a little bit easier. But the main point is that young carers themselves are requesting it. Conference, please support the resolution and in turn ask the Scottish Government to include the creation of the ID card in the updated strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. There are no cards and against. Can I ask conference, is the resolution passed by acclaim? Thank you very much. It is now a highlight of conference is John Swinney will deliver an address on our progress uh, in government. Uh, but I can say, and I'm sure you'll all agree of John, he's had a significant contribution to improving public financial management in Scotland. Those, those aren't actually my words. They are the words of the Chartered Institute of Public Finance and Accountancy, SIPFA, who have just in the last couple of days given John honorary membership of SIPFA <laughs> because of his professionalism and his values that he carries so well for this party. So please give the warmest of welcomes to the Deputy First Minister of Scotland, John Swinney, MSP. Friends, it's a great pleasure to address our conference in the exciting climate after the referendum and thank you for such a warm welcome. September the 19th was a very hard day uh, as I toured the media studios of Edinburgh. My brave face was on but my heart was breaking. The Yes campaign had worked so hard with imagination, with inspiration, with passion, with hope to give us the chance to make Scotland the country that we know Scotland can be. And we got so close, much, much closer than any of the Labour, Tory and Liberal Better Together allies thought that we would get. But let me tell you, standing here before you today, the view 
is spectacular. I see a party that's dusted itself down. I see a party that has attracted new talent and welcomed it with open arms. I see a country that is energised and I see a future that is bright, a future that is ours to win. We heard yesterday from our leader, Scotland's First Minister, my boss, as I like to call her, Nicola Sturgeon. I cannot tell you what a privilege it is to serve as the Deputy First Minister in her SNP government. And listening to the First Minister yesterday, it is crystal clear our party, our country and our future is in the very best of hands. When our First Minister took office in November, three of our precious colleagues left the Cabinet, Alex Salmond, Kenny McCaskill and Michael Russell. Each one of them played a critical part in our government. Each one of them delivered a record to be proud of. Each one of them gave everything they could to serve the people of Scotland and each one of them deserves the warmest thanks of this SNP conference. Much has been said in recent weeks about opinion polls and there's no doubt they make for pleasant reading, unless of course you're a member of the Labour Party. <laughs> but there is a poll that particularly caught my eye last week. We all know that Nicola Sturgeon is rightly trusted by the people of Scotland. More people, vastly more people, trust her than any other political leader in Scotland. But that's not what this poll said. It asked people across the United Kingdom, not just in Scotland, for their view of the party leaders. And our First Minister's ratings were better than all the other party leaders, not just here in Scotland, but in the whole of these islands. In fact, of all the party leaders, Miliband, Cameron, Clegg, she was the only leader to get a positive rating. Now that's an astonishing poll. It's an astonishing poll and it's a mark of the class act that we have in our First Minister. To those of us here in the SNP, it's not a surprise. Approval ratings for our First Minister are positive because she outclasses all of her political rivals. And we'll see that gulf. <laughs> and we'll see that gulf in class this week, live on Thursday night, when our First Minister goes head to head with Cameron Clegg and Miliband. They... <laughs> they will have to face our First Minister in political debate for the first time. Now I've got a theory about why David Cameron has been so reluctant to debate. He's dodged and he's weaved, he's begged, he's bullied. He's used every excuse to avoid this debate. I almost feel sorry for him, but I think I have the reason. I think he's been watching a DVD of the First Minister's debate with Alistair Help Me Rona Carmichael. <laughs> the trust people have in our First Minister and in your SNP government is not simply built on debating skills. It's built on her values and our values. When the recession hit and Labour sl slashed the capital budget, we invested in infrastructure projects, in jobs and in schools and in hospitals. When the Tories imposed swinging welfare cuts, we moved heaven and earth to fund the council tax reduction scheme, reducing the council tax for over 500,000 vulnerable people in Scotland, helped by this SNP government. We established a Scottish Welfare Fund. We put money in place to stop the bedroom tax. And Alec Neil, our Social Justice Secretary, is acting day and daily to mitigate the worst effects of the welfare changes. 
And now as Westminster plans £30 billion more cuts, we will fight tooth and nail to protect the vulnerable, support Scotland's economy and invest in public services. Time and again, when the big questions have been posed, when the hard judgments have had to be made, we have not been found wanting. Protecting the vulnerable, supporting the economy, promoting the national interest, that's the hallmark of the SNP government. That's why people trust the Scottish National Party. Over the last eight years, there's been a consistent pressure on the public finances through continued, a, pro, a continued programme of cuts pursued by the Westminster Government. But this austerity programme has failed by any benchmark. Westminster cuts have cost the UK GDP 5% or £1,500 pounds for every man, woman or child. Net borrowing this year will be more than double what the Chancellor said it would be in 2010. In total, over the six years to March 2016, the Chancellor is likely to borrow over £150 billion more than he planned in 2010. So even by Westminster's own yardstick, austerity has failed. But lost growth and higher debt are just the financial costs of Westminster's failure. The human cost has been higher still. Analysis by the Institute of Fiscal Studies found that the coalition tax and benefit changes have hit the poorest households the hardest. The disabled, the poor, the vulnerable have been targeted. That's the reality of Tory cuts in this austerity programme. <laughs> but the Tories are not alone. Danny Alexander and the Liberal Democrats have signed off on every pound cut, every budget slashed and every penny squeezed from the poor. And Danny Alexander has the brass neck to lecture us about the public finances. In 2010, Danny Alexander opposed a rise in VAT and opposed austerity. In government, he delivered both. No wonder the Liberals have absolutely no credibility left in this country. <laughs> and the Labour Party have cheered them on. They walked hand in hand with the Tories through the lobbies of the House of Commons to back these cuts. Labour and the Tories joined at the hip. It's becoming a regular occurrence. We got it during the referendum as well, voting together for the Charter for Budget Responsibility. Ed Balls said there was nothing, nothing in the Chancellor's budget that he would want to change. Jim Murphy supported the £30 billion of cuts to come. Well, the Tories claim we are all in this together. Well, the Liberals and the Labour Party certainly are in it. They're up to their oxters in Tory cuts. But, <laughs> but come this May, they'll sink without trace as the people of Scotland deliver their verdict on the austerity agenda of the Westminster parties. The Chancellor used the budget to boast that he had more financial headroom, as they call it. He tells us the books will soon be back in the black. He could change course. Instead, George Osborne spelled out their plan. Cuts, cuts, cuts and more cuts. £12 billion more cumulative cuts facing Scotland in real terms over the next few years. But there is an alternative. The First Minister has laid out a clear plan that will see us invest to protect our public services to deliver pounds, billions of pounds for schools and hospitals and to boost jobs and growth. And by the Treasury's own analysis, the deficit would fall in each and every year. Westminster's austerity is economic madness. It has to stop. On the 7th of May, the people of Scotland have a chance to end the madness. We have a chance to stop the cuts. We have a chance to bring sanity back to the public finances of the United Kingdom. Since 2010-11, Scotland has suffered a budget cut of nearly 10% in our budget and closer to 25% in our capital budget. That has been hard to manage. But we have maintained our public services, 
protected the National Health Service, invested in our capital estate, and at the end of this financial year on Tuesday, I will balance the budget for the eighth consecutive year. That competence is one of the great strengths of your SNP Government, but there are many others. Almost every day I travel from my home in Perthshire to Edinburgh, and each time I make that journey, I see the, the, that competence emerging in steel and concrete under the stewardship of Keith Brown, our Infrastructure Secretary. Anyone who crosses the Forth Bridge cannot fail to be astonished by the sight of the new Queensferry Crossing, the largest public infrastructure project ever undertaken in Scotland, as it rises inch by inch from the Firth of Forth, on time and on budget. In the borders, and this is especially for my dear friend Christine Graham, in the borders, the new railway will connect communities to the capital by rail for the first time since 1969, on time and on budget. And here in the great city of Glasgow, we will soon see the single largest NHS project ever delivered, the New South Glasgow Hospital, on time and on budget. <clears throat> Conference with the SNP Government on time and on budget is the rule, not the exception. It's that record of competence in government that's allowed us to build up a record of delivering for the people of our country. Shona Robertson, our Health Secretary, has taken the health budget to over £12 billion with real terms increases in funding. Shona has taken the action required to tackle the winter challenges in our National Health Service and despite the constant moans of the Labour Party, our hard-working NHS staff are treating more patients to higher standards and within better timescales than any of our predecessors in government. The police and fire reforms have been delivered. Police numbers are over 1,000 higher than under Labour. We have a 40-year low in crime. Reoffending levels are down. And Michael Matheson, our Justice Secretary, is determined to take the steps necessary to keep our communities safe in Scotland. Our economy is recovering, with economic inactivity lower than the UK and employment higher than the UK. New business start-ups are growing and Scotland's productivity is on the rise. Our External Affairs Secretary, Fiona Hislop, has developed our international strategy that's seen exports rise by 40% since 2007. And the excellent work of our Rural Affairs Secretary, Richard Lockhead, has created a dynamic food and drink sector that is contributing significant growth to the Scottish economy. We've delivered economic progress for the people of Scotland. When we took office, there were just 15,000 modern apprentices. Now there are 25,000. The council tax has been frozen since 2008. Concessionary travel has been protected. Road equivalent tariff has been introduced in the islands. Prescription charges have been abolished. Free access to higher education has been restored. These are the achievements of a government dedicated to delivering for the people of Scotland. <laughs> These are the achievements of a party dedicated to protecting our public services. These things don't happen because of Westminster. These things happen despite Westminster. Just imagine what more we could do if we had more of a say in Scotland's future. Just imagine what we could do if we had the powers of independence behind us.
For eight years now, we've based our government on the lasting values of our party and our country. We've earned the trust of the Scottish people, we've built a reputation for competence and a record of delivery, and we have the ambition to change Scotland for the better. Our First Minister has put tackling inequality at the heart of your SNP government. Within walking distance of this hall, there is poverty and inequality that should have no place in a modern, energy-rich, resource-rich Scotland. The existence of that inequality is a scar on our country. It is a moral outrage, and the ambition of our First Minister and this SNP Government is to bring the moral obscenity of poverty to an end in this country. We can and we must create a wealthier and a more equal society, and we can do it founded on participation, prosperity and fairness. There's never been a time like this in Scottish politics. There has never been an opportunity like this. In the inimitable words of Glasgow's own Elaine C. Smith, the Westminster parties think Scotland should get to the back of the bus and shut up. Well, Scotland is still talking. People have never been more engaged more passionate, more determined to have a say in what happens next. We want to foster the sense of democratic renewal that is bursting forth in Scotland. We want everyone to feel they have a part to play in creating a fairer and a more prosperous country. That frightens the life out of the Westminster establishment. That's what drives the Scottish National Party, though. We all know that a strong economy is essential to achieving a fair society, but we also believe that the reverse is also true. A fair society supports a strong economy. <laughs> fairness, <laughs> fairness does not follow after growth. Fairness delivers growth. We want to build sustainable economic growth and we intend to do it by tackling inequality. The OECD estimate that rising inequality has reduced economic growth in the UK by nearly nine percentage points between 1990 and 2010. And a large part of that time, Labour were the government of the United Kingdom in the process. That's why Scotland's economic strategy makes tackling inequality one of the two overarching priorities alongside boosting competitiveness. These mutually reinforcing priorities will help Scotland become a more productive, cohesive and fairer nation. And that practical work has begun. By improving our long-term productivity, we can ensure that the Scottish economy can support higher outcomes, living standards and wealth for the Scottish people. To support Scottish businesses, we will maintain the most competitive business rate scheme in the United Kingdom. We will invest £11 billion in Scotland's infrastructure, despite further cuts to our budget. Our Business Development Bank and our Innovation Forum will help ensure that businesses get the advice and have the financing options they need to be successful. But our Fair Work Secretary, Rosanna Cunningham, will take forward the duties of her appointment to dedicate all her efforts to ensuring that work is fair. We are establishing a Fair Work Convention, supporting a Scottish business pledge to promote payment of the living wage and following the clear example of our First Minister acting to deliver gender balance in workplaces in the private, public and third sectors, improving the value of work, of creating partnership in the workplace. That is the key to tackling the scourge of in-work poverty that's been delivered by Westminster. <laughs> We've set ourselves the task, the national mission, of breaking the cycle of deprivation forever in Scotland. Angela Constance, our Education Secretary, is taking the steps at every stage in the lives of individuals to give them the opportunity to fulfil their potential. That's why we'll invest in childcare for all, expanding nursery places to 30 hours a week. It's why we'll not stand by and allow teacher numbers to be cut. Instead, we will invest £100 million in raising attainment focused on our most deprived areas in Scotland. We will open higher education to all, making the poorest child equally able to go to our great universities. And we'll increase the number of modern apprenticeships to 30,000 each and every year. 
This SNP Government is determined to deliver opportunities for every one of our people to make their way in the world. And fairness, of course, extends to taxation. This afternoon, our Deputy Leader Stuart Hosey will set out just some of the arguments we will make to deliver fairness at Westminster, some of the policies for which we will argue, including a return of the 50p rate of income tax for those earning over £150,000. <laughs> On Wednesday, for the first time since 1707, we will start collecting taxes in Scotland under the direction and the control of the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government. And I'm so proud that on the first occasion we had the opportunity to exercise any control of taxation, this party brought the progressive back into taxation that we have in front of us. Conference, your SNP Government has worked hard to win the trust of our people. We've done that by keeping faith with their hopes and their aspirations. Your SNP Government has worked hard to earn a reputation for competence. We've done that by careful management of our public finances and by effective stewardship of major projects. Your SNP Government has a record of delivering for our people. We've done that by keeping our promises and being straight with the public. And your SNP Government has the ambition to tackle inequality and grow the Scottish economy. We want to take Scotland on a journey to being the nation that Scotland should be, a wealthier nation, a fairer nation. Our message to Scotland is simple. Come with us on the journey to a better Scotland. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, John and delegates. There's plenty uh, seats for those that are standing at the side. We'll go straight to Resolution 19 to be moved by Councillor Jennifer Dunn and second by Elsie Sheikh. Welcome, Jennifer. Thanks. Am I to go? Conference, if you're leaving, can you do so quietly? I know the hall's very full. So please welcome Councillor Jennifer Dunn. Thanks, Conference. I first, first spoke at Conference about 10 years ago as a student. And oh my goodness, it's amazing to see the size of hall that we have now and the number of people that are here today. I wrote this motion a few weeks ago. Given what's happened in between now and then, part of me feels like I should be standing up here with a tin hat on. <laughs> However, this is a very serious issue and it's something that's very close to my heart. 
I was on a train a while ago from Glasgow to Ayrshire. It was an unremarkable weeknight evening. A group of drunk guys got on at Central and then proceeded to give everyone else a nightmare journey home. In particular, a group of teenage girls got on at Paisley. The men immediately started shouting at them. I can't repeat the words that they used from the platform, but it went way beyond banter and it wasn't funny. It was threatening, it was graphic sexual language, it was horrible and unacceptable. The girls ignored them and got off at the next stop. But when other passengers complained to the conductor, no action was taken, even though no women should have to endure anything like that. When I emailed ScotRail to say what I'd seen and um, to offer myself as a witness, I asked them if they had a policy on preventing verbal harassment of women on trains, and I just got a brush off um, in response. It makes me sad, but it doesn't surprise me, as I've had similar experiences myself. During the referendum campaign, I was out canvassing in my hometown. It was a lovely sunny day, and I'd been really looking forward to it, not least because canvassing helps us win. However, when I was out chapping doors, a pack of men walked past me and instantly started shouting at me, the same sort of language as that other group of men used to the girls on the train. I don't even think they realised I was a yes campaigner or had anything to do with the referendum. I was just a woman that they came across and felt entitled to hurl abuse at. This sort of experience is draining and it puts women off from getting involved in all sorts of organisations and roles. But misogyny doesn't just take place in the street or in public places. Social media has made it easy to abuse women on Twitter, Facebook and numerous other social media platforms. Women in politics, women in entertainment or who are prominent for any other reason have to put up with more, well, with gender-based abuse that they really shouldn't have to. It also happens in many other spheres. An NUS report in 2013 found that 68% of female students across the UK had experienced some form of gender-based harassment. We can't change society overnight to eradicate bad old attitudes as much as I wish we could, but we can, do, we can take action on this. And we can force organisations in Scotland to think about how they end misogyny. It's not so much about new legislation in itself, but considering any new legislation in the light of ending misogyny, whether by measuring it, encouraging it to be reported by both men and women because this is an issue across society, or figuring out how to stop it directly. I can think of a few examples of licensing legislation where these ideas could be brought into play. Just like policies should be poverty proofed, they should be proofed against misogyny. We can also be careful about where we advertise, what conditions are put on any public funding, um, where women's customers or staff may face abuse, and expecting any company looking for public money to work to a very high standard to stamp out misogyny. I don't think it's hard to see where the attitudes of the guys that I've talked about earlier have come from. Misogyny isn't just the preserve of drunk men on trains. It's clear it is a problem across society. We've seen examples where the Sun newspaper ran those images of our First Minister's face superimposed onto the body of a bikini model. We've seen it when a non-entity Labour MP calls out a wee lassie in a tin hat. These attitudes are prevalent in society and they need to stop. We need to take action before they become any more normalised. Please support the resolution and help stop misogyny. Thank you, Jennifer. And, and Elise Sheik will second to be followed uh, by Don Osborne, who will move the remit back. Elise. Elise is a first time speaker at conference as well. Conference, it is a real honour for me to be able to speak to you in the debate today. I was the 25th member of the party when I joined two years ago when I was 17. And it is <laughs> absolutely amazing that we are now sitting at over 100,000 members. Scotland has definitely changed, for better and for good. 
Young people like me and my friends at university are all enjoying free education and the opportunity to chase our dreams thanks to this SNP government. And we're beginning to feel like our voices are starting to be heard. That is why I decided to speak for the first time today. Over the past few months, I've had to witness appalling, appalling levels of online abuse directed at my mother, Tismina. Um, it has been misogynistic, sometimes racist, and always, always very, very hurtful. And it doesn't seem to be just part of political either. Unfortunately, across the spectrum, women are finding themselves facing this sort of attack. And it's easy to say that we should just be able to ignore it, but why not implement measures to tackle the abuse instead? There's consensus that we need more women in politics, more young women in politics, more BME women in politics, with our parliaments needing to reflect the makeup of our society. So we need to do everything we possibly can to encourage diversity. The young women will not come forward if they're feeling threatened. Because being publicly savaged by someone who insults you is, quite frankly, very disturbing. So to enable young women like me to feel confident and safe in raising issues of importance to us and our country, Scotland, please support the motion so measures can be considered to tackle this abuse. I am not going to let anybody put me down. I will not. I will not ever and cannot ever be silenced. Otherwise, what message am I sending out to my, my fellow sisters, my wee sisters and my friends? So please, help us, support us, protect us. Don't we deserve it? Thank you. And Don Osborne will move the remit back to be followed by Lorna Bates, who will speak against the resolution. And Don's a first time speaker at the conference. Governor Walker. Good morning, conference. I come here with some hesitancy and a great deal of trepidation. I'm speaking for a remit for a motion that goes in the favour of the majority of our population. Women are the majority. I have no problem with that, but I am sure having made comments against the motion, I'll be accused of being a misogynist. The real problem is you can't attack me using mass media because no one knows my addresses. For that reason, I come up to express my concern at the tone of the motion. There are lots of minorities in our community who are attacked by social media. Handicapped, gay and lesbian community, immigrant communities. The motion does not go far enough. We should live in a country where irrespective of your sex, orientation, race, or any other distinctive feature should not be open to ridicule by anyone, especially through mass media. The latest news I heard was the reaction to the BBC taking a sensible judgment on sacking an irresponsible employee. They threatened the life of the boss of BBC. Why? 
What did he do? He didn't hit anyone. The same applies throughout our community. If you speak up for anyone apart from the mainstream, you run the risk of ridicule by any means available. Please rethink the rules. It's not just women who need protected. Most of us do. Thank you. Thank you, Don. And now I call Lorna Bates to speak against the resolution. And Lorna's the first time speaker at conference as well. So welcome, Lorna. Ladies and gentlemen, I feel I had to come to the stage today just to give a different view. Um, I'm not disagreeing that uh, misogynistic abuse occurs, but I feel that the SNP need to keep a balanced view both for men and women. The real issue is if there's a gender imbalance, there's an imbalance uh, throughout the whole country, throughout the whole world. The reason I've been, um, I came to the floor today um, is because at my last branch meeting, I raised an issue about the women's officer and that we were focusing, with the, we were getting the balance wrong, that the focus was too much towards women. Since that, since that um, day, I have received, I've been in contact with several men and, and women, and women within the branch. And I would like to read to you an email sent to me by a gentleman of the Stonehaven and Merns branch, just to highlight how he felt. As a man, I find the subject extremely difficult to broach, despite having strong concerns about the SNP's general approach to equality, even at the branch level. Equality for women's proposals run a serious risk of being quite divisive. It's a sentiment I've seen echoed consistently in online media and social media regarding the SNP's more recent gender balance policies. Many men are beginning to feel alienated by the SNP on gender issues because, as our women's officer said herself, they've gone too far in one particular direction. Men often feel as though they can't speak up on these issues for fear of being viewed as, at best, a social pariah, or at worst, a misogynist. The way I see forward is we are, we are a party that is fair and we, need, and we follow our hearts. This is what we need to do. No rules, regulations or laws will change, will enforce the balance. This has got to come from within, from your hearts. All this continual fighting That's between right. man and woman is wrong because we are two halves that should be one. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask if those speaking will wave the right to sum up? That's agreed, so we'll go to the vote. Uh, remap back is first of all. So those in favor of the remap back, please show. Those against the remap back, please show. Cards down, the remap back is defeated. Those in favor of the resolution, please show. Cards down, those against. The resolution is carried overwhelmingly, thank you.
We now turn to Resolution 20 on fixed odds betting terminals to be moved by Councillor Norman MacLeod and seconded by Stuart McMillan, MSP. Thank you, convener. Conference fixed odds betting terminals. I better be careful. I got a row at our last conference for talking too loudly by the convener. I'm just trying to talk over the noise from the side. These are highly addictive and dangerous things which are in our communities. Let me give you some brief statistics. People in Scotland last year lost approximately £160 million on these machines. It's estimated that more than one-third of the money lost on the approximate 4,000 machines here in Scotland was lost by at-risk or problem gamblers who are particularly at-risk of becoming addicted to these machines. A more exact figure of £158 million in a year, of that £61 million lost by people with gambling issues. You can risk £100 every 20 seconds on these machines. When you play these machines in their roulette game in this £100 every 20 seconds, ladies and gentlemen, that's actually faster and more corrosive and more dangerous than playing a roulette game in a casino where it takes two or three or four minutes for the person operating the table for the customers to uh, have one spin, one chance. On average, the players are losing seven. £1,700 a year. In this Glasgow Central constituency, it's estimated that £10 million was lost last year. In Scotland's 100, I beg your pardon, 1,095 betting shops, in total, £613 million was inserted in these machines. To give you the exact figure, 3,977 FOBTs each making, each making, each taking from the cu their customers £875 per week. That's £45,000 per machine each year. Four machines in each bookmaker. Do the arithmetic. That's £180,000 a year. They're only allowed four machines in, at the moment in each licensed betting office. They get round it by opening more and more licensed betting offices. The, the betting offices have become essentially dangerous street corner casinos. <laughs> Total losses in the United Kingdom for the last year estimated at 1.5 billion. I want to pay tribute to the Campaign for Fair Gambling and to Adrian Parkinson and Matt Zorb Cousin. And I commend to you going online and have a look at www.stopthefobts.org. A great deal of the statistics I've quoted to you come from their research. They're very reasonable in what they're advocating but it would frighten you to realise the damaging effect that this is having. Let me share this with you. The Smith Commission at page 22, paragraph 74 said, and I quote, the Scottish Parliament will have the power to prevent the proliferation of fixed odd betting terminals. Well, I tell you what's required. What's required is substantial amendment of the Gambling Act 2005, and the way to achieve a revision of that Act so that um, our local licensing boards can again take into account the interests of our citizens is to have 
the discretion and the power and the um, competence to deal with these matters wholly uh, devolved. I'll leave you one final thought. You would think that our cousins in the island of Ireland, because they're great horsey people, would be into this kind of gambling. No, in the Republic of Ireland, the number of these machines you're allowed in a betting shop is zero. They were banned, and that's what we should be doing as well. They're simply evil, and they need to go. And Stuart McMillan will second to be followed by Councillor Richard Laird to speak in favour of the resolution. Stuart McMillan, MSP. <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Delegates, and thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, I'm not going to go through the numbers, because uh, Norman has certainly done that, uh, but uh, there's a few points that, are, that I do want to highlight. But before I do, um, Norman mentioned uh, Matt Zarb cousin from the Fera Gambling Campaign. Now, Matt is here. Can, Matt, can you stand up, please? Now, Matt's going to be here, certainly for the rest of the afternoon. If you do want to find out more information about the campaign against these fixed odd betting terminals, please stop Matt uh, and, and actually have a chat with him. He's here to listen. He's here to actually provide information. Thank you, Matt. I represent the west of Scotland, I stay in Inverclyde, and the reason that, that I actually got involved uh, in the campaign and I had a members debate in the Scottish Parliament on this was because the, the Greenwich Telegraph ran an article uh, last year uh, indicating that uh, in 2012-13 some £77 million had been gambled on these machines in Inverclyde alone. £77 million in Inverclyde. And that, unfortunately, that figure had increased to £82 million between 2013-14. Now you think of those, think of that, that sum of money. If that money had been spent or invested doing other things, how much more productive could that actually could have been for the local economy in Inverclyde? Now that's just one area. Norman mentioned the situation here in Glasgow. Every local authority has got that similar story to tell. Now this, it's... Gambling in these machines is highly addictive. They're called the crack cocaine of gambling. They're not called that for nothing. And I have met a number of people who have been involved, whose lives have been adversely affected because of these machines. Now, one of the points that's actually been put to me by many of these individuals is the issue of, of personal responsibility. They do not abdicate the personal responsibility. But if you do have an illness, if you do have a gambling illness, then these machines just perpetuate that. And unfortunately, the bookmakers are not actually listening to the arguments. Now, I will give the bookmakers a bit of credit because they have undertaken and they have introduced some policies to actually make, uh, make the issue of uh, working and using these machines uh, a, bit, uh, a bit more difficult to do, but they fall far short of what's actually required. Now, when you talk to people who are at, talk to uh, Matt later on today, and you talk to people who are, are campaigning against these machines. What they're asking for is not for them to be banned, which I mean, I, I'm not against that at all, but certainly reduce the stake from £100 per spin every 20 seconds to £2 per spin. If you put it down to £2 per spin, that makes it similar to any normal puggy machine that we've actually got in the country. And if you do that, it makes it that bit more, it makes it less lucrative for the bookmakers and also makes it a bit more realistic and a normal activity for people to actually get involved in. I'm not against gambling. I don't do gambling very Stuart, often. Stuart. But okay, I don't do gambling very often. I'm not against it. But please, these machines are, are the crack cocaine of gambling. And please, at this particular resolution, I ask you to vote, actually vote for it and back it by acclaim. Thank you. Councillor Richard Laird to be followed by Jerry Boyle. Thank you, Convener. I support the motion wholeheartedly, but would just like to share with conference my experience as a local councillor of dealing with one such instance of fixed odds betting terminals. About a year and a half ago, a national bookmaking chain submitted an application to open a bookmaker's in a part of my ward called Merkinch. 
Now, Merkinch is not just one of the poorest parts of the Highlands, it's one of the poorest parts of the nation. So it won't surprise you to hear it already had two bookies within 100 yards of each other, and this would be a third within the same particular area. I and the local community council objected to the application and took it to the Highland Licensing Board. The board voted to throw out the application and to refuse it entirely. However, once this organisation's army of lawyers got involved, the decision was overturned and the appeal was granted, meaning Merkinch now has three bookmakers with 12 fixed odds betting terminals along a very short stretch of road. Now, the reason I opposed this application was not some inherent dislike of gambling, because I have no problem with that. The reason I opposed this application was because it was sitting directly opposite, literally across the street, from a social enterprise whose purpose is to support people recovering from addiction. The decision to open a business whose profit margin depends on people who don't always know when to say no across from a charity trying to help those same people is downright irresponsible and a failing of the licensing system. <laughs> Conference, the purpose of the licensing system, if nothing else, must be to protect our most vulnerable people. It currently sits with the UK Parliament and they've made it perfectly clear they have no desire to reform the system as it stands. So this must be devolved to the Scottish Parliament so they can act and we can finally get a licensing system that is fit for purpose. Please support the motion. Thank you. And our final speaker will be Jerry Boyle, who's a first time speaker at conference. Welcome, Jerry. Good afternoon. Um, I'm a Glasgow City Councillor and last year I was involved in a cross-party sounding board looking at fixed odd betting terminals and the effect it had on the population. Ladies and gentlemen, there are more than 4,000 fixed odd betting terminals in bookies Scots, uh, shops in Scotland, with approximately four billion a year being bet on them. The Gambling Act limits each betting shop to four terminals, but bookies leapfrog regulations by opening as many shops as possible. This is why we get clustering. These fixed odd betting terminals have an overwhelming concentration in areas of high welfare dependency. Gamblers in Scotland lost £158 million on fixed odd betting terminals last year, of which £61 million came from problem gamblers. Tony is a gambling addict who managed to squander £3,500 in 57 minutes on these high-speed, high-stakes gambling machines. The money which Tony managed to get to save while he was clean was to pay back debts and to buy Christmas presents for his wife and son. Tony said that he did not need to be told that gambling ruins lives. He said it had ruined his several times. Fixed odd betting terminals are causing pain and misery throughout Scotland, and there are many horror stories of people being ruined by their addiction to these machines. This crack cocaine of gambling sucks funds from families who can least afford it. What is not easily realised is that these fixed odd betting terminals are a fabulously convenient way for drug dealers to launder proceeds of their crimes. If you catch up with 24-year-old James on a weekday morning in a bookies, you will see him feed in £200 at a time into a fixed-odd betting terminal. James, who lives in an East Coast town, is not a gambler. He is a drug addict, and his interest in the machine is all about laundering money, turning dirty money clean. He feeds his drug money through the machine, losing a little and cashing out with the vast majority of his stake. He can then collect a printed ticket showing that he has gambled that day. If he is stopped and questioned by the police, he can show this printed ticket as justification why an apparently unemployed young man carries hundreds of pounds in rolled up cash. It is reported that a few number of drug dealers revealed how the fixed odd betting terminals were the gold mines for the bookies 
where also criminals' preferred means of getting hot money into their bank accounts via a third party. Because these terminals are now widely spread, it is possible for drug dealers to launder small amounts at each individual outlet and thus avoid suspicion. These fixed odd betting terminals make it easier for drug dealers to ply their trade and bring further pain and misery to family and communities throughout Scotland. Please support this resolution. Thank you, Jerry. There are no cards in against. Can I ask conference? Is the resolution passed by acclaim? It is. I'm not quite sure that the foam hands count as a delegate pass, but thanks for your enthusiasm. <laughs> uh, delegates, that brings this session to a close, but many of you may be aware at 12.30 there's a question and answer session with Alex Salmond. Uh, in here at 12.30 and then we reconvene conference.